Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being with us this evening. Uh, happy spring to everyone. This is Bill Brannick out of the Office of Catholic Education, and I apologize for a little bit of the background, background noise here to begin uh, this evening. But welcome to what is our final episode in our 1617 series of our Connected Educators webinar series. And we're great to have you with us this evening to be able to continue the topic of digital literacy and this evening looking specifically at the flipped classroom. So uh, our normal, uh, one of our normal co-hosts tonight, Alyssa DeVito, was unable to be with us as Alyssa and her husband Tim uh, welcomed a new baby boy into the family just a few weeks back on March 13th, uh, Noah James. So certainly we, uh, we would like to give all the best wishes to Alyssa and, and Noah and Tim as they are getting used to uh, being, a, being a family of three. And this evening, um, as we prepare to pray, let's keep Alyssa and the family in our prayers. As our uh, agenda is consistent, we'll begin with a prayer in just a minute, and then we'll talk about our Act 48 information, and then I have the great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, our presenter this evening, Aaron Hines. So if you would, if you would please place yourselves in the presence of our Lord and together in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, may everything we do begin with your inspiration and continue with your saving help. Let our work always find its origin in you, and through you we reach completion. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John Newman, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just for FYI, uh, and as a reminder for those uh, who have been with us, and heads up for those who are new to our series, as we have a lot of new attendees with us this evening. Uh, all of our webinars are archived uh, from the live recording, and they are archived on our YouTube channel, which you can find by searching AOP Tech. When we have the opportunity to have questions and answers, um, you will be able to raise your hand, which you will find on the control panel, which is floating on your right-hand side. And on that control panel, out to the left, pops a little navigation menu. And if you look down to the bottom, there's a little hand that will pop uh, that with an arrow. And if you hit that, that will raise your hand. And so when we come to the Q&A time, that will be an opportunity for you to ask any questions. Those questions that you ask at that point, are recorded and will be archived with the live recording on the YouTube channel. However, you also have the option <clears throat> at the bottom of your control panel to be able to ask any questions privately. And tonight I will be monitoring um, the questions pane to provide you any uh, direct feedback. And during the questions and answers period, uh, we may have an opportunity to be able to highlight some of those questions, although we will not mention the individual by name who is asking that question. But certainly, if you would like, you would be able to follow up with an individual uh, question as well publicly. Act 48 information, uh, just a reminder that Act 48 is offered uh, if you attended also the March webinar. Uh, and Act 48 follow-up is, is sent from um, uh, another individual out of the Office of Catholic Education, but that will come directly to your email to be able to complete the follow-up survey for us. So with all of the housekeeping business taken care of, it is certainly my great pleasure this evening to be able to introduce our featured presenter. Uh, many of you know Aaron through the work that he has done uh, with our schools since joining the Archdiocese in the summer of 2016. Aaron, along with Alyssa, are our tech integration coaches pre-K to 12. Uh, Aaron, by trade, is a secondary ELA teacher where he taught at both Chichester and Council Rock North High Schools. In uh, 2015, Aaron was recognized as a nominee for the Keystone Technology Innovators uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. Aaron is Google certified, and uh, as always, as we encourage uh, everyone within the Archdiocese and globally to be able to connect, follow Aaron at Aaron Hines on Twitter. So now it is time to be able to dive into our presentation. Aaron, I am going to uh, hand off the controls over to you. So you should be getting them right now. And Aaron, thanks for all of your work this evening. Uh, looking forward to a great webinar. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, see me? Everything's good? You look good, Aaron. Excellent. Um, so 
I wanted uh, to just start off by thanking um, all the attendees as well. Um, you know, our work would not be as meaningful without you being present. And uh, I, in addition to our um, very devoted archdiocesan colleagues, um, this is kind of our, our first international webinar. Um, we have uh, viewers from Saudi Arabia, uh, Mexico, uh, there's several New Zealanders who will be watching the archive view uh, version of this. So it's just really exciting. Um, and I just want to thank all you guys for, for being here because that really makes it uh, meaningful and special. Um, in addition to our um, wide audience tonight, which, I mean, talk about growing your PLN, um, we're also going to be doing some, some audience participation. Uh, there'll be several opportunities where you guys can uh, ask questions uh, during kind of an a interview format. We have two guest speakers today, um, so that's very exciting. And there will also be a, a web activity, so kind of pushing the limits of what we can do on, on a webinar and, and really connecting globally with educators from all over the world. So I'm thrilled and excited to be here, so thank you guys for joining us. So um, just starting off, we're, we're going to talk about flipped learning, flipping the classroom. Um, so just kind of starting off with basic definitions. Um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, if you would like a copy of the links for presentation, Bill just sent it out. Uh, it is case sensitive, um, but feel free. All the resource and materials are there, and a lot of the links are actually embedded within the presentation, and a lot of the pictures are actually clickable links. So starting off with uh, what flipped learning is, um, in preparing for this presentation, um, I was looking for a definition of it and I really couldn't find one. And the reason being is because it, flipped learning is much more of a, an idea, uh, an idea, a concept, than it is an exact style. And, and I think that's really exciting that um, different educators in different classrooms all can flip their rooms but in their own way. Um, and this all kind of started back in 1993. There was a book by Allison King called Not a Sage on a Stage but a Guide by Their Side. And what this book really talks about is the fact that in 1993, she noticed the fact that the role of teachers was changing. Um, and teachers, you know, because before teachers were the, the, the bastions of content, the knowledge was up in the front of the room and they were delivering it to the students in front of them. And, you know, with the advent of the internet and, and modern technology, we've seen the fact that, you know, now, you know, I may not be the best resource for something. There may be somebody else, a, an astrophysicist or a Nobel Prize winner that's making a great video. And so all of a sudden, our, um, our ability to connect with, with people who are uh, very highly trained in a specific field is now at our fingertips. And so that means that, that not only did the learning change in the classroom, the, the delivery of content, the fact that now the content is not just in one person, but it is available for all people. But it also now changes the role of the students. Because before students, you know, their job was to sit in the desk and to receive said content. And now we have this idea that, that students are not just passive learners, they're active learners. Um, and they play a role in that. And I think that's really what is so exciting about um, flipped learning or blended learning. And, and to be perfectly honest, you will hear me use both terms fairly interchangeably throughout the presentation tonight, both referring to the same type of switch within the classroom. I'm going to get a little more into that in a second. Um, below the link to the Miss um, King's book, I also wanted to do a lot of research. I wanted to find the effectiveness of flipped learning because I wanted to provide data. I, it's not just me saying that this is good. I wanted to have um, you know, the research to, to support it. And I was a little surprised to find that there's not a lot of research out there yet. Um, and, and we're going to talk about there's a couple reasons why. Um, but you see all the different terms, and, and I think that in and of itself, the fact that as researchers are, are starting this process, um, there's all sorts of different terms. There's blended, the hybrid, the web-based, um, you know, digital learning, and, and they all have kind of unique definitions that that particular research has identified. So I think it's, um, they all kind of fall under this concept of blended learning. Um, and there, there's a couple other reasons why I think the, the educational research isn't there yet. And I'm going to get to that in, in a couple slides. So I wanted to start off with basically what is it? Um, now, if you've been following me on Twitter, as uh, Mr. Brannick mentioned, um, 
you know, over the past four or five days, I've been tweeting out some of my uh, favorite uh, flipped learning images. And, and if you go on Google and, and look up flipped or blended learning, you're going to get a lot of really great infographics. Um, this one I wanted to present to you guys because I think this is really emblematic of um, kind of the, the more traditional methods of education and then um, the kind of current or the, the blended flipped learning style of education. So I get to use my pen here. So here we have the starting on the old way before the flip. So, uh, you know, step one here we have is uh, students read over the materials. Um, and and I, I have to admit, uh, in, in college, certainly there, there may have been a few nights where uh, that reading didn't get done, which means I, uh, I had to show up right down here to step two here in the lecture. And um, I'm sure one of these bald guys is probably me, and this guy probably has some hair on him. Um, anyways. <laughs> So not only have I, I, you know, I didn't do the reading, perhaps. So now I'm coming into a lecture blind. Um, and this was even more challenging, more compounded by the fact that, um, you know, I may have been on chapter two and, you know, this professor is on chapter five. So now I'm, I'm trying to receive information that I'm not prepared for. And, and consequently, that, that lecture may or may not have turned into a, a little bit of a nap. Um, which then brings us all the way down here to the bottom, um, you know, the, the midnight oil being burnt as a, and then probably some tears pouring down as I try now to basically read the textbook, read my notes, and, and end up teaching myself what I, was, I should have learned earlier. Um, and then having to repeat that whole process. Um, challenging, difficult, and it's understandable why, uh, you know, students struggle with homework. And, and then that burden gets shifted to parents or guardians, and now they're left with, well, I don't, you know, remember Calc two. How do I do that? You know, so with flipped learning, what we're doing with flipped learning is we're really taking these two columns here, the the reading material and the the rote delivery of instruction, the the lecture, and we're taking those, and usually we're taking them and creating a video format. And, and whether it's a teacher created video or whether the teacher has, has you know, scoured the internets and, and found the perfect video and, and sent that to the kid. Um, but this concept, the getting the material and, and the initial introduction and that lecture has been moved into a video format before class. So this does a couple things. Um, you know, the fact that now students, they, they have this ability where they're not seeing the material for the first time in class. Um, and a lot of times these videos can be a lot more informative than just reading a textbook because of the, you know, there's examples and there's tutorials and you can, you know, the digital technology to really show what does the inside of an animal cell look like? What does a mitochondria do? What does a ribosome do? And, and sometimes video really can convey that material in a better way than like a textbook can. Well, now you have students that are coming to class, and in class, instead of me, you know, staying up all night trying to figure out how to do biology or physics on my own, now that happens during class. And I think this is, this is the, the phenomenal aspect of flipped learning. So now if I have a problem, well, I'm surrounded by peers. So I can turn to the student next to me and say, hey, you know, you got that problem really well. Can you help me? Now the instructor isn't tied to the front of the room here. Now the instructor can move around the room and work one-on-one -on -one with kids when I say, hey, I, I don't understand that question. So that's where traditional education really kind of stopped. But with flipped learning, we get this third step down here. The fact that students now have an ability, they, they've received the content, they've learned it here, they've practiced the content. So now when they leave class, they're feeling empowered, they're feeling confident, they're feeling ready um, to move on to those next steps. Because if you think about it, down here, I didn't leave class feeling confident and ready, but with the flipped learning model, I do. And so now, outside of class, now I can apply, I can create, I can analyze. So we're moving into those higher level depth charts. So I'm, I'm you know, whereas here I was at a one, maybe a two of depth of knowledge, now I can move into the analyzation and the creation using that new information. So that's kind of a, a general overview of what flipped or blended learning is in a sense. We, we take this content, we move it before the class, 
in class. We, we essentially did with the traditional homework in class. And now we have time for application and projects and creations. And that's really something that's great about it. Oh, all my, let's see here, eraser. Erase all drawings. There we go. So now that you have a, a general idea of what flip learning is, we're going to move to the, the audience participation of this webinar, and, and this is a, a brand new thing for me, so we're going we're gonna to see how it goes. So what I'd like you to do, I'd like you to think about um, your own academic career. I want you to think about um, a, a lesson or a teacher maybe you have, and I want you to think about what would have happened if they had flipped your class. So instead of you going to class and getting a lecture and then going home and having to do the homework and trying to figure it out on your own, what if that were reversed? What if the lecture was done at home through like a video format, class as a practice? And with that in mind, you're going to go to this link that Bill just sent out in the chat window. It is also case sensitive. And that's going to take you to Padlet. And what I want you to do is all you need to do is double click on the screen and you're going to get a little text box. And write me one, maybe two sentences. Doesn't have to be very long. But tell me how you think. Um, a blended approach, how that would have impacted you? Would it have um, changed your major? Would you be in a different field? Um, how would that have, have changed something about your own education? I'm going to give you guys some time to do that, and then we're going to come back to this as a group and look at it. So again, you can, if you're on this uh, slideshow, you can click right on this link, or you can copy and paste the one that Bill sent out through the chat window. Go to Padlet, double click, and we already see somebody in there. That's awesome. So, let's take a second. little pause. Um, while you guys are doing that, I want to talk a little bit about the history of flipped learning. So, with flipped learning, um, the, the kind of founders, if you will, there, there are three gentlemen who are, who are kind of credited with the the flipped learning idea. Uh, the first gentleman, Sal Khan, uh, 2004, he had his uh, young cousin, Nadia, and uh, he was at MIT at the time, and she was struggling in mathematics. So this is, this is early in the internet, so he's actually using uh, Yahoo Doodle, if you remember that. And he was making very basic doodles and, and sending them to her to help her with math class. And, Eventually, he ended up putting them on YouTube, and they started to get some more traction. And then in 2011, um, he gave kind of a, a seminal TED Talk on the use of video in, uh, in learning. And uh, it has since grown. I, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, a small site called the Khan Academy. Um, you can tell just uh, it, it's huge. It's amazing. It's a great site. And so all these, this is uh, Forbes wrote a great article about him, how he changed uh, Education, his link to the TED Talk is right here. So really kind of phenomenal um, breakthrough in terms of how to use video and, and what learning can look like in a digital age. At the same time um, that Mr. Khan was doing math videos for his cousin, we have two chemistry teachers out in Colorado, right in kind of the shadow of Pikes Peak. We have Aaron Sims, he's a gentleman with a bow tie, and um, Jonathan Bergman. And sometime in the neighborhood of 2007, 2008, um, a lot of different sources kind of had different dates. Um, basically, they, they went out and bought a $50 program to take their PowerPoint videos from their class and to convert them into YouTube videos. And something very similar happened. Um, you know, all of a sudden they started getting traction. Um, the media really picked it up. And to this day, they are um, very, uh, very humble. In fact, they, they do not accept credit for the, the term flipped learning. Um, they actually credit the media for, for developing this term as they were uh, kind of coming out with these great tools. And again, um, this is a link to their website, which we're actually going to come back to in a little bit. And this down here is they have started a, a flipped learning kind of a academy or foundation. And uh, there's a lot of really great resources there as well. Um, so I've talked, I, I mentioned a little bit about it, but I wanted to talk about why you would want to flip your classroom. What are the benefits? And 
And our panelists tonight are going to kind of definitely go more in depth on this. So I think the first one, I mean, in terms of, of the benefit for teachers, um, I know that when I was standing in front of, I was an ELA, an English language teacher, um, in terms of literature. And so a lot of times, you know, if, if I'm standing in front of a room delivering a lecture, um, the only students that I really engage with are those few brave students who, who raise their hand and timidly, you know, Mr. Heinz, you know. Um, so I'm only really engaging with a few students. With the flipped learning, I have a lot more opportunities to engage with, with other students, regardless of their willingness to, to raise their hand or participate. Um, and, and so that's, that, I think, right there is, is a phenomenal thing. Anything that gives me more time in the classroom with my students working one-on-one, -on -one, because that, for me, as, a, as an educator, was the most valuable time I had. Um, the other thing, and, and I referenced it when we were looking at the, um, the graphic earlier, um, when I flipped my classroom, I wasn't tied to the front of my room. I wasn't stuck to the, the, the Promethean board right here, the PowerPoint or Smart Board right here. I had much more flexibility to walk around and engage with the kids and to, to make sure I was touching base with every single student. Um, and I think really the, the other benefit for me as a teacher was the fact that, you know, there's a lot of things that, that I know about and that I can uh, confidently deliver to students. But there's definitely areas where, you know, it's outside my skill set. And the fact that I could grab um, a really great video by somebody who is a, a rock star in their field and bring that in, that was huge for me. Um, and lastly, we, um, I, I have some videos for you uh, a little bit later where you will get to see this. Um, so as an English teacher, um, ninth grade, research paper was a big part of what I did. The first thing I had to do was teach them MLA format. And, and when I tell you that I can teach you how to format a document in Microsoft Word and MLA format in my sleep, I must have given that lecture 30, 40 times. And finally, when I finally realized, I was like, no, I should just record this. And now I could just say when kids are like, well, how do I do? Did you watch the video? Go watch the video. So much better. Um, and, and it was really, it was freeing for me as an educator not to have to give the MLA format lecture anymore. Um, so how can it benefit students? I think um, with the advantages of video, and we're going to, we'll, we'll go more into some of the specific advantages, um, they have the ability to learn at their own pace. They can start, stop, rewind, fast forward. Um, and, and YouTube, I love YouTube, they, they put closed captionings on everything. So if you have a student with a English language learning ability or um, who's just a visual learner, you can speed it up. You can slow down videos. Uh, they can go run at half speed. So it just, I think the, the tools within the videos themselves allow for the information being much more accessible to learners. Um, the fact that you know students come into the classroom prepared, engaged, excited, they already have a good idea of the concept of whatever you're teaching. Now they're applying it, um, which is really kind of the, the best part, I, I think, of, of learning is, OK, I know, have something. Now what do I get to do with it? What, how can I use it? Um, the, the fact that students help each other. You know, we talk about the four Cs. Well, collaboration is right there. And uh, I think that any opportunity where we can work on those soft skills, uh, the, the working one-on-one, -on -one, the collaborative events, the um, connecting with other people, those are skills that I think we all can say has helped us later in life as adults. You know, no one works in a bubble. We all work as, as members of teams and groups. And those skills are arguably just as important for students to develop as, you know, their math, science, and English abilities. So I, I like the fact that flip learning affords class time for that reason. Um, and then I think finally the fact that like they get to then do cool stuff in class. Um, and, and I don't want to say too much more on that because I, we have a great presenter um, who's going to talk a little bit about what she's done with her students. So I will leave uh, some of that to her. But I think the, that is really those are some of the big picture benefits for both teachers and for students. Um, now, I did mention that I was looking up some, some um, studies about flipped learning, and um, a lot of what I found were much like this first study, very broad picture studies, um, studies where, where teachers kind of um, reflected over the year and said, yes, you know, these have improved. 
I chose this first study um, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, they had 453 teachers, so a, a nice large sample size. And generally, we have a 67% increase in test scores. Um, and both studies, by the way, are available if you click on these links. But I think, and, and definitely increased test scores is, is wonderful. But I like, I think for me personally, this right here. The fact that ninth grade failures went from 44% to 13%. Um, for me, uh, anything that's going to help those struggling learners, those kids that, that aren't getting the information, that's huge. And we, we see a very similar trend reflected on a, a Villanova engineering study now. Uh, for those of you who do not know, I am a graduate of Villanova, so I felt certainly inclined to uh, promote the, their fine work. Um, and what this study found was, now they, the study found that there was increases at all levels, but the greatest increase was at the bottom third of the class. Uh, the number of students um, that went from a D to a C in the class grew by 10%. And for me, that's, that's pretty exciting, the fact that um, using flipped learning can really target those, those struggling learners, those learners that, who otherwise might get left behind or might you know, drop out or not pursue a career in engineering. Um, I, I think this is a really great example of what flipped learning can do. Hopefully, as you know, flipped learning becomes more prevalent, um, we'll, we'll see uh, the educational research community kind of standardize their definitions and, and hopefully create some, some broader studies, studies that uh, have some more data to really, because I think uh, there's a general feeling in the, the teaching education community that flip learning is a good thing, um, but it's really great to have some, some really good studies to support that. And uh, I was actually chatting with uh, one of my uh, Twitter followers from Saudi Arabia, and, and that was the, his exact focus for flip learning. So I, I think uh, I look forward to seeing those results when they, uh, when they come out. So a really great thing. So that being said, now that we have kind of a, a general overview, I want to talk just briefly about my experience. Um, so I told you I was a, a ninth grade high school English teacher. Um, the students that I received, uh, they were the, um, the lower track students. So these are students who generally had a lot of uh, struggles with attendance um, for a variety of illness, sports related, um, you know, counseling sessions. Um, they also tended to be, um, you know, light on attendance. So when we came to write the research paper, a, a challenging endeavor in and of itself, I was faced with the task of how do I keep this whole group of students on one spot? You know, when I have kids, when you know, I see this student two days a week and this student three days a week, um, it's a little challenging. And so what I did was, this is really kind of my first foray into like that flipped um, classroom. And you know, mine is a little different than the traditional. Um, for me, they didn't watch the videos outside of class. I actually had them watch in class. And so what had happened was, you know, when the students walk into class, say week two, week three, well, I have a student over A over here who has been in class every day. They're doing a great job. They're, they're, they've done their research. They've done their outline. They're on to that first paragraph, second paragraph. And so I could say, hey, great, you're going to sit on this side of the room. And everybody, if you're working on your first paragraph, you're over here. And I gave them all the videos all at once, and I, I would tell them, okay, watch the first paragraph video, and it was tremendous. And at the same time, I could have, you know, that other student who maybe was out for an illness or a sports in injury, you know, they're still on the gathering resources um, aspect of things. And so they could come in and say, okay, here's the video that you need to watch for that. Um, and so it really allowed me to kind of differentiate my classroom the other thing that I was doing while I was uh, teaching basic research paper writing skills, I was also teaching them computer skills. And, and this was the first time they had had uh, computers. And so learning how to navigate Microsoft Word, how do I set up a hanging indent in a paragraph? And so I was able to use, um, I use Screencast-O-Matic, and, and there's a resources page in a little bit later I will share with you guys. Um, but I was able to actually walk them through, click here, go to this button, drop down to this menu, and they could start the video, watch 10 seconds, pause, do that step, rewind if necessary, continue going, and it was phenomenal. Now, making videos about formatting works cited pages, 
are not terribly exciting. So in order to kind of motivate my students, um, I embedded little Easter eggs into the videos, um, often of me uh, singing bad music. And of course, uh, I, I have for you here this, this rendition I did. This was uh, back in, uh, I think, the beginning. And let's see, I clicked out of it, so let's see here. So we got to get to the bad singing part. This is the best part. And and I, I got into it, and then we, uh, there's dancing, lots of bad dancing, and then we go back to working on paragraph two, the body paragraph. Um, <laughs> So I, I, the kids liked it, if nothing else. Uh, it, it put a smile on their lips. And then I started getting requests for, you know, do Wrecking Ball by Miley Cyrus. And, you know, I, I'm late at night in my classroom singing bad songs. It was, uh, it was an experience. I'm sure uh, the, the people walking past my room enjoyed it as well. Um, and fast forward a little later into my uh, academic career. Um, I was teaching a unit to, at a different school. Uh, to students, 11th grade, American um, English, American literature, and we're, we're really focusing on uh, some of the seminal documents um, from early, um, that were written, you know, as we were coming a country um, early in that time. And I felt that it was important for my students to have an, an understanding of the historical context of what was going on with, you know, Puritans and Pilgrims and, you know, what are they and are they similar, are they different? And so I, I'm a huge fan of uh, Crash Course. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course U.S. History. And today we're going to cram 150 years of American history into one video. Why? So this was something that I actually was able to send out to them as homework. And that way I knew when they came into class um, that we all had at least a baseline understanding of you know, American history, and, and we could use that as we started reading and analyzing literature. So um, that was a, a really uh, great tool to, to help increase uh, the engagement in the lessons and, and to really help um, them understand the literature that was being written at that time period. So at this point in our presentation, I would like to invite uh, the Director of Technology for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, Mr. Bill Brannick. Um, to have kind of a, a conversation with us. Um, I hear the birds chirping in the background, sir. They were as surprised as I was to see that video uh, that you put together with you singing. So <laughs> that is their official response. Oh, I can't wait. Um, so during our conversation, we also want to open up the floor to our viewers. Um, so as you, as, as Bill and I are chatting, if you have questions about flipped classrooms, feel free to um, raise a little hand icon in your control panel, and uh, we'll come to you. We're gonna, um, Bill and I are gonna talk first for a few minutes, and then we will open it up for the audience, and you can ask both him or I questions. Um, so Bill, as as a former high school administrator, um, you know, if you were to walk into a school where you know your teachers watch this webinar. They love it. They all flip their classrooms the next day. What's that look like for you as, as an administrator walking through your halls? Well, I, you know, I think the first important piece is that um, it's certainly number one, it, it's good to try, it's good to test it out um, with something that you're comfortable with, a lesson that, that you've worked on, um, you know, and have refined and see how you will be able to, um, you know, to do the things that you just talked about in flipping the lesson. Um, I don't think it's going to be something that is going to happen in every class for every lesson to achieve every standard um, in every content area. But I think that there are the right times um, where it does provide a higher level of engagement. But what does it look like if, if I'm walking around the, uh, the hallways and, you know, doing my walkthroughs? Um, I think it's a, it's a higher level of one-on-one -on -one involvement and engagement between the teacher and the students. And, um, you know, it really also drives the, the idea of the personal learning. Um, so you still have, as a teacher, the opportunity to be able to meet your, your standards, your objectives um, within your classroom, um, while also being able to tailor the lesson specifically to, you know, to the individual learner. So if, if a student 
grasps a concept uh, much easier than another student, um, you have the opportunity to be able to provide them with additional lessons, lesson uh, aspects in the lesson to be able to move on to while you're still going over and, uh, and working with some other students that may be having a little bit more of a difficult time, you know, to, to try to help them understand uh, what, what is taking place. Now, you, you mentioned engagement, and, and I, do you think that that would have an impact in terms of like student culture or, or you know, when they're more engaged, how, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, on, on, on engagement, I think, um, you know, the most important thing for teachers and students is the relationship. And it, you mentioned it, uh, you know, a couple of minutes ago as far as those students who may be brave enough to answer questions in a classroom. Um, I know personally I was one of those students that um, I, I was always very hesitant uh, to raise my hand. And I, I got very good at looking around the room to see when everybody else's hand was up and gauging when the teacher was going to pick that student. So at that last moment, I put my <laughs> hand up um, so that out of the corner of their eye they could see um, that my hand was up and I was going to participate. And a lot of it was just self-confidence. But if, if I knew that that teacher, you know, was going to come around and work with me individually, that obviously would have, would have been better for, for my, you know, learning outcomes. But, you know, I would have seen that the, that the teacher uh, and I had really had that one-to-one -one individual relationship. Now, I also wanted to ask you, as a, as a father of, of three small children, uh, they will one day grow up to become teenagers, and uh, scary as that probably might sound. Um, what are your thoughts? You know, when they come home and their homework is, I got to watch these videos, Dad. Uh, so I'm hoping that they never become teenagers, because as a principal of a high school, um, and we'll leave it at that. Um, no, and it, it's funny. You know, I obviously look at, look at this in a, a bit of a slanted view, um, being in this position, um, but also. You know, as an administrator, um, you know, I taught the, the entire time I was in school. Um, so I often provided, uh, you know, homework as go home and watch these videos. Go home. Now, I taught marketing, so it, it certainly helped um, in marketing to tell them to go home and watch, uh, you know, commercials or during the Super Bowl to be able to watch the, uh, the ads there. But it certainly helped us with um, when we did our, our Cyber Day program. And, uh, you know, when we were out of school for inclement weather, all of our teachers did flipped learning. Um, but additionally, as a parent, I think that's an important piece that you bring up. You know, I can vividly remember coming home from whether it be elementary school or high school and sitting down with my parents and them going over our homework. And especially when it came to math or even, you know, looking at, at, at social studies history. Um, you know, my mom and, and my dad having to go back and, and relearn some of the concepts themselves. But I think the ability for them to be able to sit there with their kids and yeah. learn along with them uh, is certainly something very powerful where they have the opportunity to be able to participate in learning, um, you know, but not, not just try to catch up to, to try to support their kids. No, I, I want to... Um continue on that thread. I do want to remind our, our viewers that if they have a question to raise the hand in the control panel and, and we will pass the microphone to you. Um, so back to you Bill about the, that notion of homework. Um, do, do you feel that, that the idea of what homework is is going to change as kind of a, a, a global educator picture moving forward? Um, it, I think the conversation has already started. Um, certainly I think the idea of homework um, needs to change. You know, it, it needs to be less busy work and, um, you know, more true engagement in, in what is taking place. You know, the, the, the thing that I really like about this concept and, you know, the, the idea of homework is that it can really be self-paced. Um, I still do it in my own learning, um, whether I'm trying to go in and brush up on uh, Excel tips and tricks or trying to go and learn the the newest thing within uh, G Suite you know YouTube is one of my top resources but my ability to be able to my ability to be able to go in and press play press pause at the right time and rewind and replay something for me as a learner is very important rather than just listening writing notes 
and then being unsure why that note I took, what it, what it specifically referenced. So that sure. ability to be able to rewind and, and be able to go at your own pace, I think, is very important, and and that it's not just busy work; that it that it's you know authentic engagement and um, you know in in the lesson to be able to meet the standards and the objectives. So so back on that topic of parents, and, and um, you know, as an administrator, I'm sure you had teachers that that had you know problems or, or there were parent teacher interaction, and I can imagine that a, a teacher starting a, a flipped classroom would, would do that. And there could potentially be a parent out there who, who might come in and say, hey, you know, this isn't, what are, you, what are you doing? You're not teaching. That's not the way, you know, I did it when I went to school. So what kind of, um, how as a, a teacher would they, would you recommend they approach that issue? Um, I, I think like anything, you know, communication is most important. Um, certainly as we look at our, you know, the generation that's going through school now and, their parents, um, we are still going to to encounter the the rebuttal of that's not how I learned, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so certainly communication, you know, with the uh, with the parents is important. So before you would start any flipped lesson, um, you know, send a communication home explaining what is going to take place, explaining why it's going to take place, and explain how the outcomes of what's going to happen are expected to be different and keep them in the loop throughout the whole process. And, you know, as we talked about a minute ago, I think to, to really get engagement, um, invite them to participate, you know, invite them to, to you know, uh, talk with their kids and engage with them about, hey, you know, what are you doing here? Uh, show me what's going on. I, I would really be interested in learning about this subject as well. Well, I like your point about watching the videos with, with the kids. I think that was that would be really really exciting and, and opportunities to grow and connect as a parent and child, that, that's tremendous. Um, just in closing, um, any any thoughts for, for our teachers out there about flipping? Maybe they're on the, the fence or thinking about it. Any thoughts for them, sir? Um, I, I think as I started, you know, towards the beginning of my comments, um, pick something that you're that you're comfortable with, um, you know, a lesson that, that you enjoy, a lesson that you're passionate about, and start there. You know, don't go into it looking that you're going to flip an entire unit, that you're going to flip an entire quarter or semester, depending on your grading system. You know, start small um, and, and experiment with it. And you know what, be open with the kids about that experimentation. Um, and, you know, as long as they're aware that they're trying something new and trying something different, but you're going to hold them accountable at the same time. Um, you know, I've personally found that the kids are, are tremendously engaged. And then communicate with the parents and let them know what's taking place. But don't hesitate to try it. Um, try it. See what works. Talk with your colleagues. Reach out to your PLN online through social media. Um, and then reflect and, you know, modify as you go forward. That's great. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking the time out to join with us tonight. Um, and to the viewers in the audience, please be sure to uh, follow Bill Brannick on Twitter. He's Coach B O O six six. And uh, as you may have noticed in our presentation tonight, uh, there are several Bitmojis we're using. And uh, if you uh, click on Bill's Bitmoji here, um, it actually is going to take you to um, uh, Mandy Tolan. She's a math teacher out of Missouri, and she has a great it's her, her personal like kind of classroom blog, and she really talks about how she uses bitmojis in her classroom. And I thought it was fascinating. So thank you again, Bill, and uh, I really appreciate your insight on those matters. Absolutely, so, and I'll be here um, monitoring the, the, the questions, and uh, again, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, sir. So I want to take an opportunity to come back to Padlet, um, and, and this is so cool. This is great. We are collaborating from around the world. Uh, so we have somebody I, I think I might have understood biology better. Uh, ooh, my love of learning. I love it. Math and I might have got along. This is great. Oh my, and I, this is really cool. I love people that like have replied to each other. Uh, class more interactive and interesting. This is phenomenal, and this is uh, a, just a great digital tool to start that collaborative process. So maybe this is part of your flipped classroom is, you know, that's part of their assignment. They watch a video, they put their comments here, and the next morning you go over them. That's your bell ring So um, I really appreciate all the, the viewers from wherever you are in the world. We kind of came together on Padlet, and that was really cool to me and exciting. So thank you. This is great.
Um, so moving along in our presentation, uh, we talked about kind of what flipping the classroom is, what blended learning is. Um, now what I want to do is, you know, how do we get started? So I think my advice here, you, you and, and to echo what Bill mentioned, you want to start small. Um, I personally, I like the idea of looking at, at say the next you know week two week unit and what are you doing and look at and find that one concept what's the one thing that kids are going to struggle with what are the, what are they what's going to give them problems and I would recommend flipping that lesson because I think when you flip that lesson the lesson that before was the one that, that kids always struggled with you're going to hopefully see um, you know a large amount of growth and you're going to see a, a, a topic an area or a unit where kids maybe you know didn't understand as easily before and hopefully they might come into class and, and be really really uh, you know energized and have a better time with that concept so I would recommend think of one thing that's maybe challenging is coming up and flip that one thing and once you've built that that one thing then you can start building um, with with any type of flipped learning or, or blended learning these things are scalable um, start small start with a lesson Maybe you move to a concept, a, a unit, um, and you know if you want to go a, a class, sure. And, and I think, uh, as, as Bill mentioned, that this is something that pairs with that traditional education, where not every lesson has to be flipped. Start with one and go from there, and, and see how you grow as a, as an educator and as a, a as a classroom flipper. Uh, in terms of, of teacher creating video. Um, you know, there, there's the two schools of, of either finding something else that's out there that's already been created and either just using it or modifying it. Uh, then there's the, you know, the, this emphasis on creating video themselves. And, and I think, you know, the purpose of these videos and, and the, the dancing videos, which will now live on, on infamy in, in YouTube, um, you know, the idea was I was trying to connect the pouring concepts of MLA formatting to their lives and, and I think that's the beauty of video um, and uh, you, one of the other things about YouTube and I've, I've talked about YouTube a lot so far is uh, the tools and one of those tools you can actually see how long people watch videos for um, and uh, I noticed that really that 7 to 10 minute mark is, is the sweet spot videos that are longer than 10 minutes a lot of times people will, will turn off or click away um, so really as either you're creating or you're looking for videos out there start with and, and honestly I wouldn't start with a 10 minute video I'd start with maybe a three minute video or a four minute video max and then go from there as you're building those um, those videos you're, you're filming them you know your content you know your audience and you should have an idea what is your objective what are you trying to convey with this video what are you trying to do um, and I really recommend engage the kids and as much as uh, the videos about me singing bad karaoke songs were fun for me to make, it was really about engaging my audience, my, my students. Um, so to create those connections, a lot of times I would like feature a student in the video or I'd like have a Santa hat on like the classroom and stuff like that. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, with that all being said, my final tip on, on creating teacher videos, not everything is a Hollywood production. Um, you know, there's definitely times where it's like, do I need it to be perfect or do I need it on Tuesday? You know, and, and I think that's, that's a, a, a real challenge. And there were definitely days where my video was me with my cell phone doing a quick selfie video and sent that to kids. And it wasn't perfect. It was one take and it went out. And you know what? It worked. Um, so don't get caught up in trying to make, you know, and I've seen teacher videos with multiple camera angles and they got lighting and that's great, but you can really keep it simple and, and don't worry about the, the production value as much as you worry about creating those connections and engaging with the kids and conveying that, that content. Um, in terms of general tech tips, I mean, I think, um, you know, a lot of times with flipped learning, and, and I saw, and I talked about it in the history, you know, 2004, 2008 was when Khan and, and Aaron were, were creating these, these ideas of flipped learning. Why are they just here? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with the, the technology. We're getting more technology in schools, in students' hands. And I, I would uh, challenge you to not let, you know, your access to technology to limit you. 
um, you know, find either a, a cell phone or an iPad. Um, these things are, are becoming more and more prevalent, and I really uh, don't let that that excuse of oh I don't have you know super powerful computer to stand in your way of, of trying the flipped classroom. Um, and the last two points I think really it's important to, to coach the kids. This is going to be new for them as well. Um, you know the first time they're going to go my homework is to watch a video. You know tell them what are you looking for? What are the you know what are the objectives? What are the you know is there a check for understanding or assignment that's going to go along with it? And like everything else, be ready with a plan B. Um, you know, I'll talk a little bit later about student accountability, but um, there's always going to be that kid who doesn't do their homework. So what's the plan B? Or the internet breaks, all the tubes get clogged, and the connection goes out. What's the plan B? So I think especially as you start flipping, as you start this, you know, talk with your kids, tell them what you're doing, why you're doing it, and, and make sure you have that, that kind of that reserve in back in case you know, things don't go the way that you intended them for that first couple times. Um, with that being said, I, I really am excited to introduce our next um, interviewee, uh, Miss Christine Mello Hemsley. She is an amazing teacher from Newman Gretty. She has 11 years of classroom experience. Christine, are you there? Uh, I'm here. There you are. Perfect. Uh, Do you have a, a video? Um, I do have video. I'm trying to figure out how to turn it on. It'd be the little on the control panel right I underneath the microphone. Uh, got it. Of course. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> All right. As you're getting that set up, um, I also you know, uh, invite our viewers. Um, Miss uh, Christine has done an incredible job flipping her classroom. She, she, I think she teaches all the subjects practically. I mean, AP history, uh, debate, U.S. history, uh, orchestra. D did I miss any? No, I mean, that, that covers it all. Debate, U.S. history, AP, U.S. history. Um, I do, uh, sorry, I'm like, I do have video capability. There I go. Hi. 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 Um, so anyways, yes, I teach AP U.S. History, U.S. History, uh, Debate, and Orchestra in the afternoons. Yes, I know that's a lot, um, but we're going wow. through an interesting change at Newman Goretti, so they needed some extra hands on board, so that's what I did. That is amazing. And, and just like my conversation with, with Bill, for the audience out there, um, we want to hear about your experiences with flipping classrooms. So if you've tried it, if you, know, you have questions or concerns, feel free to raise your hand or uh, send them questions through the chat window, and uh, Christine and I will be happy to answer them. So, uh, Christine, just to, to start off, um, tell us a little bit about, you know, you, you have a wide variety of subjects. I know you flipped your classroom. What, what's that all look like? Give, kind of give us a, an overview, if you could. So, I flipped AP U.S. History first simply out of necessity. So, I had... Uh, there was a redesign in AP US History in 2015, and there's a different set of skills that now need to be taught that my students had not had on the way up. How do I balance the time between uh, I need to teach certain skills and also teach a massive amount of content? And I thought, if I make videos and make them watch it at home, because they're not going to read, we try to get them to read as much as possible, and I do assign reading, but they're more likely to watch a video than anything. Um, how can if I assign these videos, then maybe they could come in with the material in hand, and we could work on things organically together. The skills that were needed it kind of happened in this weird way, and I didn't really know it was flipping a classroom until someone had noticed said to me, <laughs> "That's a flipped classroom," and I thought, "Oh." <laughs> I had no idea. I was just doing it out of necessity. Um, I had prezies that were made, which are um, is a uh, I think it's it's not accurate. Um, oh, it's flash based, and it, I have all all those created for the chapters anyway, and I would use them in class. So I just screencast them, and that's how I flipped the classroom. I did that in AP US history first, but I. To do it in music as well, uh, music in, by nature is a flipped classroom. You give a concept, the kids have 42 minutes to try to learn that concept and teach one another. It's just by nature that we do that. And I've been teaching music a lot longer than no, any that, that's, that's crazy to me. I mean, uh, 
music is not a subject that you often hear about being flipped. Walk me through. What's that look like? Yeah, so it's 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 funny because all these things that we're talking about are things that music educators are already doing and have been doing for a very long time. So um, there is no say against quote unquote sage on the stage to say what you you know what you used. Um, Again, kids come in, they know where their instrument is. There is no come and sit at your table or your, your chair and I'll tell you where to go. They come in, the bell rings, they come in, they know where their instrument is. I've taught them how to put it together, how to tune it, how to do all these things. They have a place where their music is. They sit down, they have a partner that they work with and then they try to change as much as possible. They choose who to work with and I have a concept for them. Today we're going to get through playing um, this section in uh, Phantom of the Opera and it'll be in B flat so this is what I, the skills I need you to do. I walk around with an instrument in hand, kind of play over them, say no, 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 try this, let's try this, show each other, hey, so and so, go over there and play that part with this person and it's this organic environment and that's how music has always happened and we only really come together as a group in rehearsals where suddenly I'm the conductor and I'm leading as it would be in a traditional sense but we spend actually 95 percent of our time in a flipped environment It has been that way since the inception of music education so when thinking about APUS history I thought well I guess I need to drag that back into my classroom where I was just thinking like a music educator in that sense and okay. brought it into my classroom and so the music class was first for you and then, yeah. then it was AP history yeah, it, it, yeah, 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 actually, okay, so, um, yeah, if I understand your question, because I was gabbing too much, um, yeah, I, I, I'm primarily a music educator, but I also have a whole degree in history as well, so actually, I am a performing cellist, uh, I am a music educator, have been for 11 years, and, um, but my graduate degree is in music history, and I have an undergrad in European history as well. So I had this blending anyway, uh, but the two do really go well together, and the concepts that you learn in both actually go hand in hand. So again, I didn't even know I was doing something that was called a flipped classroom. It just existed, and it works, so I brought it back and forth. So uh, when we, we spoke earlier, you mentioned uh, like an audio track that you'd have the kids listen to. Right. So... Um, this year I'm attempting a pretty difficult um, concert for the spring concert, which is a high, the, the theme of which is a secret, so we're, we're not giving that up yet. If you're on okay. Facebook, please go to the Newman Goretti Orchestra Facebook page. Uh, we'll be playing games with that. Um, the kids wanted to do this set of music, and it's quite difficult, and I need the kids listening to the different parts of the orchestra. So part of what they struggle with is... Um, I know my part, and I know what I should sound like, sort of, but I don't know what I should sound like when I'm playing next to someone else and if that person is slower or faster. So what I had done was I sat down with another student or a couple of students who were strong players, and we said, let's just record a bunch of parts, and I'll play a bunch of different instruments, and I'll play all the parts, and we'll just keep recording them. And I'll throw them on Google Classroom, and when the kids are struggling and they're like, I don't understand this part, and I'm like, have you gone on the Google Classroom and have you listened to the part yet? And now I catch them with their headphones on listening to the music. In fact, they're doing it so much that I'm like, what are you doing? You listen to something else? And they're like, no, 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 I'm listening to the part. Uh, so it's, you know, it's one of those things. And it, it is working. And that's something that um, I was doing some time ago when I actually taught um, at a private school, uh, Villa Maria, actually. They were younger, and we started doing that so parents could hear their parts. So actually, yeah, that was one thing we used to do, make sure that they knew the parents were hearing what they were doing and make sure they're practicing the right stuff. That's so, exciting. So again, I just a uh, reminder to our audience out there, if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat window or raise your hand. Um, so Christina, I wanted to ask, you mentioned AP U.S. History, which I, I know for, the, for those of you who have not taken it, it's, it's quite overwhelming. The test is in, what, early May, late April? May 5th, May 5th is DJ for us. So, wow. And yeah. You have a lot of information to get down in, in that one thing. So kind of looking back when you first flipped that class, uh, what were some early mistakes or challenges that, that you kind of faced? I think it, I initially again started flipping it just to get the content out and the first couple of mistakes was make, putting, the, putting the videos in places that weren't universally um, accessible. Okay. So I would say, oh, it's on um, 
I would throw it in Google Drive, but not every kid was sure how to use it at the time. Now they're much better at it. Um, instead, having access to Google Classroom, which came out after that point, I can just, you know, there it is. And, and you can go and get it. So that's one of the things that I think having it be universally um, found is really, really important. Um, they don't have to be, as you said, great quality, but they can't be like the worst thing ever, too. Um, so the kids will tell me if they, if the, the if the, the, I, it, initially I just used a cell phone because again I don't have a ton of technology at home either most of my stuff is at work or great cameras but the kids would tell me if they couldn't see something as long as they can see the screen and it is interesting I think that that's really that's what's really important and I too like to do different things give them a little bit of Easter eggs and whatnot for me my Easter eggs in my AP lectures are my cats which show up randomly knocking things <laughs> over or friends that knock in the door that I ask to be guest lecturers that's great I love it I love it. Um, being that you you clearly have been doing this for quite a long time, I'm sure you have uh, amassed uh, quite the toolkit of flipped learning resources. Uh, can you give me like kind of maybe your top three or four? Like, what are things you really like or you use often? Do you mean like applications? Sure. Uh, okay. So I really like. With regards to showing presentations, I really, really like Prezi. I know Prezi.com. I know we've all probably heard about it and it's been beat to death, but I really like it because it's interactive. Not interactive. It's it's active. You can, in panning, instead of going straight from slide to so slide, you can play with the different um, portions and or screens in that case and they can flip and move and that to me I'm a visual learner I'm also an oral learner and when I see stuff fly around a screen I'm way more interested than just slide to slide that's nothing to say about anything you know because PowerPoint is an amazing tool as well um, I really like Prezi um, I really like using the remind app to remind everyone to please um, check out if I put a uh, published or posted a video I will tell them I'm actually going to show you the remind app now hey um, I just posted a video I'm expecting the following so on my phone it is if we can I hope we can see it. no we can't see this well it says remind it's because I have a light a light above me and you it keeps a public record I do think it is I in fact I'm almost positive and Aaron you could probably correct me on this it is the archdiocesan accepted way that you talk to students it's, um, yes it's really great and even just tonight, there's all my classes. And I, oh, by the way, I run stage crew as well. Um, there they are texting me. And kids will send me things just randomly to tell, tell me, you know, like, hey, here's a video I saw. I just got asked a question about Jonestown by an orchestra student who's doing a book report. <laughs> So it's one of those things, you know, and it's great. I love that. It's a great way to talk to students. Um, and I think, I mean, God, the holy grail has got to be Google Classroom. It's been the greatest thing ever. So really, really great. Well, uh, uh, back on, on the Remind, I think for those uh, viewers who, who don't know, Remind um, is designed for teachers. And, and it really it provides uh, security, whereas the students don't have your phone number, you don't have the student's phone number. And because everything's logged, it can be a very secure way to connect with your students. Um, you know that that's better than giving them your actual phone number or something like that. So that's a great tool. Tell me a little bit of Google Classroom. I mean, it's a fairly new. Oh, uh, there's a the message. Yeah, telling them I was proud of the, my orchestra yesterday and how well they did. But yes, yeah, so, cool. so yeah, it's great. It's it's and it, it, you can put you can print your conversation anytime with a kid. So, for example, you know sometimes a kid will use Remind to reach out to you in the middle of the night and tell you that they're sad or something like that. You need to get guidance to them. This is what this is for. But yeah, wow. but back to Google Classroom. That's incredible. Um, so I, I guess the next question I really want to ask for, for teachers out there who are thinking of flipping their classroom is, is can you tell us about how the students react? Because I'm sure, I mean, especially starting 11 years ago, that this was, this was something that was very new to them. So when you first started recording the videos and sending the videos, how, how did they react from, to that? I think really the first time I started doing it, and it wasn't totally uh, like I didn't start doing it 100% 11 years ago. Um, YouTube was just a baby at the time. 
Um, I started doing it more, more like eight or so years ago. Okay, um, but it's still early in the flipping. I don't want to mislead anybody. I think I've been doing it. I've been doing it since 2000. I'm no, just kidding. Um, yeah. So I think initially the kids were like, "Yeah, I'm not going to do this." Definitely not going to do this. Um, and then it just became natural. And it, especially in the history aspect, uh, which I started doing after the redesign in 2015, it, it was just natural. There was no pushback. And I don't get pushback from parents either. I know that I, I just, in fact, I was just talking to a parent uh, the other day, and she said, I love hearing your videos because I get to hear what my son's learning and how you teach. And I think that that's really cool. And I think parents are interested in what we do. They like to see what we do. And this is a way for them to see that. You know, they are paying for their child's education at the end of the day. And to see what we're up to is great. Or how we interact with their kid is really great. And knowing that their kid is invested in what we're doing is good, too. I really don't get pushback from the videos. If I get anything, if I get anything, and mine... Because it's history and because it tends to be AP along, and I even send the same videos down to um, U.S. History College Prep. We don't have tracks at Newman Gretty. We have um, all everybody's in a college prep uh, course. Okay. Um, and then there's honors and AP. Uh, but if anything, you know, I get really into a topic, and my husband, who is also a history and music teacher, we both get into the topics. <laughs> and then, Why was that video? really long. Well, it was long because the Civil War was really interesting. <laughs> then we wanted to show you this other video within a video, and then the cat was crying, and we thought we'd tell you about bullets and things like that. So if anything, I think they get mad when they're very long, but they get mad when I, when I don't talk about something they want to hear about, too. So, wow. Yeah. That's, that's exciting. Um, have you seen, uh, and I, I, this is good, and I'm glad you corrected me, so uh, you started flipping about eight years ago, so you had, you know, a couple years without flipped instruction and a couple years with flipped instruction. Um, have you seen uh, an impact grade-wise, or, or can you talk about that? I think that the skills are much better. I think when it comes to skills-based work, so how they're reading documents and um, how they're interpreting that information, how they work with one another collaboratively is better because they are collaborative learners. At the end of the day, that they're, they're a shared generation. So that's something we have to keep in mind. And um, I think they're more independent. I think my students had expected me to lecture, which is, you know, sometimes you want to lecture too because you got a really good topic you want to talk about, and that's okay too. But I think when you straight lecture, the students expected you to know every single little thing, and they expected you to kind of feed it to them. So when you gave them a document and you're like, let's dig through a document, they were like, what do I do with this? And I think now when I'm like, I have all of these things that I like qualifiers that I say like, hey, we're going to do um, – the following things, and I have this document. So tomorrow we're actually going to be comparing in AP US history Malcolm X versus Martin Luther King with source documents and doing a Venn diagram sharing out. They know what to do. They know that when the stations are set up and we have six stations in the room, they know where to go, they know who to go with, and they just get to work. And what I like is the independence. To the, uh, to the test scores, um, that's hard to generate because we're only really uh, we're changing the way we're testing at Newman Goretti and things like that. So um, and that's hard to say. What I can say is again, the skills are better. I think our standardized testing is showing that, but I'm about to start looking at some data with my administrator uh, soon, just kind of talk about that. So I'm not sure, but I theorize that it might be. Um, I think the hardest thing is to balance the content. As long as the kids are watching the videos and taking the notes and doing the work, the content is covered. If the grades go down, it's probably because the content's not. They're not doing their end of the work. So you have to set that expectation. This has got to get done, guys. you got to do your end of the bargain. That's, so a, that's a great tip. Um, uh, in, in closing, um, I, I, first of all, would like to thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, I think your insight to the teacher role and the, the classroom role has been tremendous. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you for having um, me. I, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, similar to Bill, in terms of, uh, any advice for, for that, that teacher out there uh, thinking about flipping their classroom? Um, you know, any advice or tips that you would like to share with them? I think when you're getting ready to do it, let's say you're going to do it, 
I think the best thing to do is to just be upfront and honest with the kids and say, look, this is what we're going to try. I'm going to try something. Here's why I'm going to do it. And I think the more realistic or real we are with the kids, we're high school teachers here. They're looking for real. And when you say, guys, you know, I looked at your last test and I think we could really use some work on um, understanding historical um, fiction or something like that. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to send something home this time. I want you to cover it. We're going to come in class. We're going to play a game. We're going to break out. And then we're going to look at some stuff. And then, you know, give them a chance to tell you how they felt about it. Maybe if you give them a um, feedback or something like that that they can then give to you. You can hear their thoughts, hear what they they're, they're feeling about it, and adjust as needed or just stay with it. And they'll probably end up liking it anyway. Um, but I think if you're just real with them and tell them why you're doing it, it'll transition easy. Try it out a couple of times. You'll probably really like it. It is it is work. You're going to have to do a little bit of extra work. But then once the work's kind of completed, you can, I, I pull videos from a couple of years ago that are still useful. I just try not to reference modern day in it in my videos because I can't <laughs> use them again. And i got to redo them. Um, Chrissy, if I actually ask you to hold on for one second, we have a, a question from a, uh, a viewer. Sure. Um, who asked, what are the criteria in choosing, I think, the method for flipped learning? Are they the same as the traditional classroom? So I guess, uh, I guess when you're deciding whether you want to flip a lesson or you want to do it traditionally, um, what are kind of the, what runs through your head? Um, I try to think about what's so there are certain, I know my students well and you know your students really well, and there are some topics they really really like and they're going to be ones that you want to do with them in class and for AP US history that was the Holocaust we wanted to do that together in class so that was something I didn't flip chose not to flip because I know how much they like it um, they all but then also sometimes they really like to watch a video in the comfort of their home or there's a big game over the weekend something like that so I'll flip the classroom on a different lesson but also another criteria is if if if, the, if there's content but there's also a major skill I have to teach I'm going to flip it because I've got to get that skill in and content doesn't need to be subservient to skills but I think in order to get the content you need the skills and in order to get the skills you kind of need the content so let's cover the content the night before and then come in to get ready to do the skills and really you're just kind of expanding your teaching day so I'm sorry that I'm not being as clear as I think I could I think for my things that I really really enjoy and I want to get their gut reaction I'm going to do in the classroom with them but they're rare uh, a lot of the things I send home, even if I do like them, because I know it's going to help the students, biggest thing is if it's a skill-based thing that I need them to get, then I'm going to flip the classroom. That's great. Hope that helped. Well, Christine, this has been a pleasure connecting with you. And uh, uh, you mentioned a Facebook page for the Newman Goretti Orchestra. Yes, if you look up the SS John Newman and Maria Goretti Catholic High School Orchestra, or at least High School Orchestra, you'll find us. We only have 100 people who have liked us so far, and we're really great. We have 50 kids, which is one of the biggest in the Archdiocese, and we're really excited to get more people to see what we're all about. And we're on there. We're on Facebook. It'll be great. Our concert is April 27th at 7 o'clock. I can't give away the theme just yet, but it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. Well, it has been pretty awesome chatting with you tonight, and I really appreciate all your uh, help and your insight. So thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> all right. Take care, Christine. Uh, for those viewers who would like to connect with Christine as well, her email address is listed on the screen. Um, so with the remaining time, I wanted to just kind of address um, a couple things. Uh, you know, the question that I get oftentimes is like, well, if I flip my, my classroom and the lectures at home and they, they're going to come in and do stuff, you know, what if they don't do it? And, and, you know, my answer to that question is, well, how do we check homework now? Um, you know, I, when we assign homework as, as, a, as an English teacher, you know, they knew that if I assigned chapter uh, two for them to read, uh, the next day they're going to come in and probably have a quiz on chapter two. Um, you know, so I think, and, and I think if you are transparent with the students and say, hey, you're going to watch this video, you're going to do this work at home, and then when you come into the school tomorrow, there's going to be some sort of assessment, whether that's a quiz or uh, an intro ticket. Um, you know, I think that helps keep them accountable. 
And then I think you can can follow that up with, you know, maybe you have them do something while they are watching that video, whether it's filling out a form or going on Padlet or uh, submitting something through Google Classroom. I think there's ways as teachers that we can um, kind of help hold the students accountable to do that work. Now, will the students, are, is every student going to come to class every time prepared? No. Um, I, wish there, I wish that was a, a reality, but the fact that you know, we will always have students who don't do their homework the night before. Um, so as teachers, that means we need to have a plan. What's going to happen when uh, students come to class without having watched the video? And I've seen some teachers where they um, you know, will have a section of the room where they'll set them aside and, and they're to watch the video. And then they don't get to do the cool, fun, collaborative activity with the rest of the students. And now they're behind. Uh, I've seen other teachers where they assign, you know, a, a, a laborious task of, you know, some some sort, you know, writing a long paper or writing an explanation why. Um, so I think there's there's a lot that teachers already possess in terms of their toolkits that they can use for students. Um, I'm actually going to skip over, well, the overcoming barriers section. So the two big barriers. Um, most notably, the first one is a lack of internet. And, um, you know, I think this is really important that you know your population, you know your school, you know your kids. And um, when I was at Chichester, and before we rolled out our one-to-one -one program, our tech director had a map and put all the libraries and local businesses with Wi-Fi. And if you think about it, businesses, you know, it, it, Burger King has internet, Walmart has free internet, um, the corner pizza shop may not have internet and you know what we had people approach those businesses and say hey couldn't you get internet because we're going to be sending our kids home with devices and those businesses by putting in internet profited from having the students come and getting a slice of pizza and doing their homework at the store so i think um there's a lot of other you know available resources out there and, and that's not including friends houses or smartphones or grandma's house and you know this this doesn't happen too much anymore, but I've even seen it where uh, the teacher has the spindle of you know CDs or DVDs and burns it to a, a CD and hands it to the kid, because if I made the video and sure I put it on YouTube, but that means I also put it on the kid's flash drive. And I had students where that was what they did. At the end of the day, they gave me their flash drive. I saved the video there, and they went home and watched it. The second biggest barrier that that I think a lot of uh, teachers run into is is the lack of device. I don't have a tool at home. And and for that, I think the, the first solution is C number one, the library, friend's house, um, smartphones. That's a huge resource right there. The second resource I've seen is a lot of schools have started doing uh, recycled device drives where they ask community members to bring in uh, old iPhones or old tablets and wipe them and hand them back to kids as either loaner devices or as you know they can check them out and these devices you know they don't need cell phone connectivity they they just need Wi-Fi and so as long as they have the device they can go and watch the video on YouTube and answer the question so I think uh, the two biggest barriers internet and device and there's uh, definitely some good solutions for them um, I wanted to, to close tonight's webinar by providing you guys resources for both uh, the flipped learning community. Um, the first one right here, my list, um, this is a, a list of resources, many of which I used in this presentation tonight. Um, I have there's several really good videos, including uh, the Hip Hughes video, which is, is a personal favorite of mine, uh, Sal Khan's TED Talk from 2011. Uh, the second resource is the flipped learning community on Twitter. And, and as tonight's attendees can attest, you know, I connected, we connected through Twitter. And I think as a teacher, um, I'm really growing to see the power of being on Twitter and connecting with other educators. And just looking at the flipped learning Twitter page, we see that they have a lot of resources uh, for someone looking to flip the classroom. 
And I mean, just by looking at their followers, they, they're a tremendous resource to reach out to, you know, to tweet and say, hey, I need help with this, and you will get responses, um, which I think is just uh, tremendous about our, our community of educators, the fact that we're willing to cross borders to help each other in our classrooms, which I think is amazing. Um, <clears throat> the bottom one down here, this is uh, the Flip Learning website, um, which has additional resources in, in addition to the ones that they have on their Twitter page. So this is a, a great site. Once There we go, once it loads. So six models, there's just a tremendous wealth of resources here. And then of course we have the hip hues video here. Um, in terms of classroom creation, um, Edu Creations is a phenomenal app. It's uh, for iPads. What it does is it allows uh, teachers to basically, if you have a presentation already on, say, like Google Slides or Google Sheets, what it does is, and I'm going to mute this video, um, so we can see it'll record the video, and then we can see that the teacher's actually uh, annotating the screen live. And so this is a great resource. If you have an iPad, you can uh, record everything on there and send it out to the students. That's one I particularly like. Edpuzzle is another one of my favorites. This is a, a great tool because it curates videos and they also build a lot of um, learning tools, assessments into the video. So you can have a video where the students watch the video and then halfway through the video, um, it, a question pops up and they have to answer a question before they can move on. So that's a really great tool. Um, down here I have both Screencastify, this is an extension for the Chrome browser. Um, it is free and it's a great tool for recording uh, presentations. It has a webcam feature which is great. Uh, Screencast-O-Matic was actually the video tool that I first started using. Very, uh, and this is also free. They have a, a paid model. I believe it's fourteen dollars for the year. It's a one time or fourteen dollars for life. It's a one time fee, and it the pro version gives you some added editing tools, which is is quite nice. I just want to jump back to Edpuzzle because it looks like it's loaded, although not entirely. So uh, we'll have to come back to that one at a later time. Uh, over here we have Aaron Sams, and Aaron Sams, uh, one of the, the original flipped classroom individuals, actually had the opportunity to meet him at uh, the latest Petency conference, the Pennsylvania Educators Technology Expo and Conference uh, in Hershey, Pennsylvania. I was in a room with him, didn't know who he was. He was just a cool guy who knew a lot about video and come to find out kind of one of my, my personal educational rock star heroes. Uh, so if I, I wish I could kind of go back and rewind that and uh, you know shake his hand again or something. But he has compiled a great list um, whether and each one of these are clickable. So if you're interested in video creation, he has a, a whole list of tools and you know how to use them in terms of um, you know, setting up green screens. He has a whole series on that. So really great resource. Um, another social media tool that I love in addition to Twitter is Pinterest. One that I was not familiar with really until I started in this position, but wow, what an amazing list of resources. And um, I provided a, a link. I, I kind of collaborated and gathered a whole bunch of resources. Um, and I, I put them together, and this is a great, it covers everything from green screening to, uh, to different apps. So a really great resource, and if you're on Pinterest, please feel free to uh, friend me and AOP Tech. Uh, we're always trying to grow our followers. And the last resource that I wanted to highlight here um, was this one called Recap. And this is one that, uh, honestly, I, I just came across but it really sounds like it's going to be a transformational piece of technology. What it does is, is it allows students and teachers to create videos um, to use in terms of assessment and reflection. It's a free resource, um, and it really looks like, and, and this is one of those tools that I think once you've started flipping your classroom, once you've got comfortable uh, with videos and utilizing videos in your classroom, 
I think once you're at that level, this would be the next step. When you want to up, up the game a little bit more, now have students creating those videos. I'm going to pop over to Edpuzzle just to see if, nope, still hasn't rendered. So um, what's great about Edpuzzle is the fact that you can um, take a, a video, say like a TED Talk, they're 20 minutes long a lot of times, and you can cut the video down to just what you need. You can insert your own uh, audio beginning or ending. Um, you can insert questions, and then you can send that to students. It pairs with Google Classroom, which is phenomenal. You can send that to kids, and then you will have a record of who watched it, what they watched, how long they were on it. Uh, if they had to rewatch anything, you get a lot of data, and uh, I really like that. So really some great tools. They're all clickable. Um, and so finally, I just would like to, to thank um, everyone for coming. I, I want to thank Bill and Christine for uh, being uh, willing to come on and, and to chat with us. So I want to thank you. And I want to thank um, the AOP community for attending and for the international community for attending. And, and please, uh, we will post this video on YouTube. And uh, please feel free to share it with your colleagues, share the resources, and connect with us on all of our social media accounts, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. Um, you can connect with me directly through either email or Twitter. And with that being said, I want to turn it back to you, Bill. Well, thanks, Aaron. And as I think you probably would be able to see, night has fallen around me. You're, you're still uh, on the patio. I like it. I am still on the patio. I am soaking up. Uh, every minute of this beautiful weather uh, that we have here this evening. Um, Aaron, I, wa I want to thank you for, uh, for all of your preparation um, for tonight. And um, certainly that is being reflected in the, the questions panel uh, right now uh, for the great prepara uh, preparation and all of your work tonight. Um, I do want to remind everyone, uh, just as Aaron mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes ago, you know, this is our final um, webinar for the academic year, the 16-17 academic year. Uh, we, we finalize in, in April and we are going to be um, sending out a both a survey that I just put in the chat window to get feedback on this webinar but also uh, shortly hereafter once we finish up the elementary webinar in a couple of weeks we'll be sending out a survey, survey who, to everyone who attended our webinars um, this year as far as um, how we might be able to improve uh, both the approach of the webinar and the content to be able to best meet your needs. Um, but just because our webinar series is done for this academic year doesn't mean that the learning stops. Um, and the ability to be able to connect uh, with us from AOP Tech, but also to be able to, to connect together for all the great things that are happening in the schools of the Archdiocese, all the great things that are happening in the state and our country and globally. Um, the AOP Tech brand is a way to be able to connect with educators uh, following us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, and Instagram. And as well, you don't have to be an Archdiocese of Philadelphia teacher to be able to join us on Remind um, and have those updates pushed out to you either. And we quite often uh, will send out reminders and updates on Remind before we send them out um, to teachers through our superintendents. Um, or through our other methods of communication. We, we use it as, a, um, as an early uh, registration uh, platform to be, able to, do, uh, to be able to do that there. So um, certainly as we close up, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, we are grateful for your participation this evening and happy to be able to answer any final questions that you may have. And it looks like everybody uh, everybody is quiet. Certainly, I appreciate the questions that came in through the question window. And Aaron, you had an opportunity to be able to ask um, Christina and myself this evening what would be you know a recommendation that we would have for teachers in, in starting out with the flipped classroom. Um, it's my turn to ask you the same thing. Uh, what's your final thought on you know a recommendation for teachers to be able to to get started in uh, in this pedagogical approach? Um, to do it. To try it. I, I think uh, the, what sold it for me as a teacher was when I saw how well it worked with my students and when I saw um, how much 
easier it made my job as a teacher the fact that I could connect with the kids one on one. So I would my my advice to them would be to jump in, record a, a short video on, on an upcoming topic and see how it goes and just give it a shot. Excellent. Awesome. And uh, we just had a comment uh, from Faith over in the Harrisburg Diocese that she is looking forward to giving it a shot as well. Um, and as a final reminder, along with connecting with us uh, at AOP Tech across all the uh, social media platforms, um, tomorrow evening you will be receiving a follow-up email from us here uh, in the technology department that will be able to provide all of the resources that were um, sent out in the chat window tonight as well as the uh, the, the final uh, feedback form uh, on tonight's webinar. So look for that. That will come out right around uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow, Thursday night. Um, so with that, uh, Aaron, once again, I'm going to uh, thank you for all of your time and your preparation uh, for the past number of weeks and getting ready for this evening's webinar. And uh, most importantly, thanks to everybody for attending tonight. Um, if you see any areas for us to improve or if you like this webinar, certainly we are open to any and all feedback. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with you uh, throughout the remainder of the year through the summer and as we prep for the 17-18 academic year at AOP Tech across all of our social media platforms. So thanks everybody for joining us. Have a wonderful night. A great end to your week and enjoy the spring weather. Bye guys.